All right, look at that. Pop will eat itself is in the car. It's car con carne. Uh, we have no food. I should have bought you food. I'm sorry. Are you hungry? Uh, I've just eaten, found a nice Middle Eastern uh, uh, sort of, well, it was just like a little restaurant. It was very nice. A falafel house. Yeah. Plenty of good food in Chicago. There's lots of good mm. food in Chicago. Yeah. It's, we're known for that. So Pop will eat itself. We're in front of Metro, I should say, Car Con Carne, presented by the Autobahn Mazda of Evanston. A bit of a stone's throw from, let's say, Britain. Um, but Pop will eat itself. We're in front of Metro for Cold Waves. Tonight, the annual benefit. Uh, it's three nights of incredible industrial, mostly, uh, music. You're headlining tonight around 11 o'clock. So long after the, the specter of the Cubs has disappeared from the area, Pop will eat itself on stage. It's car con carne. Let's eat in the car. It's car con carne. And now here's the star of our show. James Van Alstom. All right, so uh, introductions. You are. I am uh, Graham Crab, Crabby of Pop Will Eat Itself. And I am Mary Biker of Pop Will Eat Itself and over the years various other various things. Well, and that's the thing. Everyone who's playing this weekend has played in like 20 different projects. And everyone knows there is an incestuous vibe to the whole mm. industrial type scene. That's yeah. right. Well, because even you, Graham, you've been in, you're, you play with Primitive Race, which is another Yes, yeah. Thing. I've done stuff with Primitive and Race, which is, uh, yeah, very exciting. It's some good stuff. So I, I'd worked with Pigface, and obviously I was in the Gay Bikes and Acid before. Well, I think everyone's worked with Pigface. Yeah. I think I'm in Pigface. You probably are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to be going on tour with them in November, so... Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So let's let's go back to the very beginning with Pop Will Eat Itself. I remember I first heard Pop Will Eat Itself probably in 89. Back then, were was the use of samples kind of like the American Wild West? Did, could you just get away with whatever? Like, here's uh, an Iggy sample, here's a, here's a Lips Incorporated sample... Kind of. It was uh, one of those, you had to run it by the record company and uh, there were some things that they just said no to. Um, a lot of it, they said, okay, well, we'll run with it. And some people knock on the door and send you letters and uh, say, we want a bit of money for that. Uh-huh. Uh, but it wasn't I mean nowadays you know you hear stories of uh, people using something and they get hit for 100 percent yeah. so it was never that bad you know we had to pay out a few grand here and there but it was pretty much wild west stuff you could get away with with a lot here's what being in Chicago is like we're actually in front of Metro we're, we're parked right in front of Metro you're the headliner people are just they don't even care they don't even pay attention oh there's a like people are just eyes forward they're not curious about anything they're just going to where they need to go to they don't realize that pop will eat itself is sitting right in front of metro right now yeah if only they knew <laughs> if only they knew if only they knew suckers <laughs> yeah from the beginning graham I, pop will eat itself has always been I, I think kind of difficult to pigeonhole there's punk spirit there's obviously industrial and dance and elements of hip-hop and i think that's the secret to a cool band isn't it a band that you see on stage and you walk away saying what the hell did i just see and that's always kind of been your vibe Maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I never saw it, saw it as intentional as that, but, you know, now you say it, 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 it was kind of, it's very much true that we've never wanted to be pigeonholed, and I've always felt very uncomfortable if somebody does pigeonhole us and think that we're this or that, and I'm thinking, well, no, we're not. <laughs> well, that's, you're right. It's a, an interesting band. It's something that doesn't do the same thing as everybody else. But... Uh, the definition of being pigeonholed is actually yeah it's easy they they're they're this and and i agree i think poppy's you know i joined the band late on and i've had to learn the songs we, we've just been doing this last year this is the day this is the hour which is such a great you know i didn't really you know i remember the records at the, at the time but i on listen on, on sort of repeated listen because i had to learn the songs i just realized what a really great record it was and I couldn't really say it's an industrial record, it's not right. a hip-hop record, it's not a punk record. It's all of those things. And and for that reason, I do think it's a genuinely overlooked great record. You it's know? a great record, and it's 30 <clears throat> years old this year, mm, which right. is stunning to me. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about it. Well, tell me about that era. I mean, Pop Lead itself, this was really the breakthrough. I mean, I, I, I will forever have... We like the music. We I, it's stuck mm. in my head just on repeat. Tell me what it was like 
breaking through during that time in the 89? Uh, well, we'd done some stuff which was more sort of punky, poppy to begin with, and uh, you know, that was all well and good, but then as soon as we got in the studio, we saw all this technology and thought, well, you know, wouldn't it be great to use or know how to use this equipment? And uh, so we'd try and hook up with people who did know how to use it. And uh, we'd started listening to tracks that, that did use those type of uh, instruments. And uh, so it's a bit of a learning process, really. I think the first album, Box Frenzy, if I listen back to it now, you can, I think you can tell it was kind of a... Uh, that was our apprenticeship if you like <laughs> and this is the days where it really it hit it connected and sure. this is where that's where we got our swagger and we knew what we were doing and knew that we were good at it I guess a couple years after that Pop Lead itself was unceremoniously dumped from RCA that was peak grunge that was Nirvana era they didn't know what to do with you mm. at that point did you think Maybe we just need to wait this out. Like, when pop culture will catch back up to us? Or do you think, well, well, fuck those guys? Yeah, kind of. I mean, they sort of wanted us to take that extra step, you know, to having top ten records and, you know, being... I suppose they'd invested money in us and wanted to see a return on that investment. Whereas we weren't really that career-minded, we were more interested in our art and having fun. Uh-huh. Uh, so there was kind of a, a clash clash of interests there. Well, and the joke was on them, because a couple of years later you hit with RSVP and Ikbina and Houselander, which are still, I mean, those, those hold up to this day. Those are great songs. Yeah. Well, funny enough, it was the same A&R guy um, at the, the major label we got sacked from who then set up his own independent label and took us on because he always believed in us. Yeah. So he was kind of a, a lone voice in the, at the major label. So it's, you know, Corda Marshall um, always believed in us and, and took us on. And when he started his new label, we were his first act. I love it. You are the only through line in the Pop Will Eat Itself story. How would you, looking back on all these years of Pop Will Eat Itself, how would you define the Pop Will Eat Itself story, legacy? Wow, that's a big question. It is. <laughs> <laughs> you're, not on, you're not on stage for a couple hours. we got nothing but time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, I don't know how to answer that. Well, I, I, how about, let me rephrase. What were the high points? or What, what were the high, What are the things you remember the most? And it could be emotions. It could be specifics. Yeah. Uh, being asked to tour with uh, Run DMC and Public Enemy was a, a great honour. Um, ditto Nine Inch Nails. Um, having Trent put us on his label over here. Um, so things like that where you know that you've got the respect of your peers, I think, mm-hmm. is, is something special. Um, I do try not to think about it too much and I just try to let it be organic that's why I find it a difficult question yeah I get that I, I don't because you're an active artist yeah I don't I don't have a master plan it's to <laughs> me it is what it is at any particular time and it, it's kind of you know just just let it be don't put too much th- thought into it is it easier to be pop lead itself now, given the evolution of technology, I mean, we all, all three of us have computers in our pockets, basically. Mm. I mean, compared to the days where you probably were sitting in front of a bunch of reel-to-reels and who knows what. It's easier in some ways, but then when you consider how hard it is now to get away with samples, and to be honest, samples are still just intrinsic and ingrained in, in probably every time I sit down to write some music there's going to be something sampled in there that, that's that's what I do so it becomes a case of having to disguise it more having to uh, use sound that people can't go ah they, they've used that you have to just be yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to be cleverer with it let's talk a little bit about Cold Waves which is why we're here tonight three nights and a lot of Ch- bands with direct ties to Chicago are on the bill. I mean, I think 16 Volt and Chem Lab are like honorary Chicagoans at this point. What's your what's your feeling? Is there a sense that, okay, as an artist and as part of this community, I should be here and 
as you were saying earlier about like the collaboration thing that's that's a great thing in music people actually and I think you know when we, we actually did this before and and uh, we were, were wondering how it would go down it's like oh is it oh, is it industrial you know obviously there was the Nine Inch Nails Association and to be to, to feel a part you, you do actually feel a part of a community and I think that is quite genuine with everything and um, it's it's great you know it's like it everybody gets on pretty well and you know people are people everyone seems to know each other a lot of these people in a lot of these bands are in you know yeah we've got a drummer we've got a standing drummer today who's played in a few of the other back with some of these guys so yeah i think um and obviously the metro and this this particular spot has a a great part of the of the history of, sure. of the music i mean when i first came here sort of I guess it was the early 90s and I was playing in pig face Chicago was the hottest the coolest place on earth you know that was the time yeah I, I you know I remember rehearsing with pig face and we would go to I, I, we went to a bar somewhere and in walked Bono and and Julia Roberts and the edge <laughs> like and it was something like the rainbow or yeah. some small little bar in sort of nowhere but they were in Chicago to sort of suck up the vibe yeah. and it was just so happening so and it was, you know, but you, nobody really realised it was going on. And but it was very exciting, and it was, it's, uh, you know, it was, it's. Chicago's always had that sort of between LA and and New York. It had the sort of best elements of both. So I think it's sort of everything sort of really, and, and it's sort of out of the way enough to sort of yep. have its own culture where it sort of incubates and sort of does its own thing. So yeah, I mean, um, I think it's good. I think obviously the you know the whole Jamie Duffy and the the the, the, the fact that it raises money and yep. awareness for and that's what I was kind of getting at. And I realized I have a hard time talking about it. It's, it's a hard thing to bring up, and which I guess speaks to the importance of this event. Yeah, I, I mean, I had a hard time saying. So you're doing this thing, which is about you know, preventing suicide. Yeah, it, it's hard to talk about. Mm. I don't think people would talk about it enough either. You know, yeah. and and I think it's something if people have those feelings, they, they there's not a lot of there's no one that not a lot of great deal of support because people don't talk it's a taboo exactly uh, it's like you exactly. supposed to internalize these things so I think you know obviously anything that um, anything that can bring that consciousness to people and that they can talk about it and that this is we've t turned something they have you know Jason the guys who put put this thing on have turned that around the, the, the situation that happened and they tried to make something positive out of it and the fact that he loved that kind of music and he yeah. was a pivotal part of the the community uh, is it, it, you know that so that's great you know so uh, as far as that's concerned it's that makes it even better you know because it's it's like it started off as one gig right turns and now it's like th four days and then now they're doing it in Los Angeles as well so I you know I, I hats off to Jason and, and oh for sure for the this is not easy to put together yeah mm. not at all what's next for Papa Lead itself uh, we've got three more dates um, in the States. We do Baltimore, uh, Providence, and Denver, and then we go back home. We tried to do the West Coast, but there was visa issues, shall we say, so um, hopefully we can do that at some point. I don't know when, but that will have to be rescheduled. Rescheduled. All right. Thank you. Pop will eat itself. Uh, this is Car Con Carney. Thank you for watching on Facebook. Tell a friend. Uh, support them. We've loved them now for three plus decades. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Which seems implausible because we're all 25. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 26. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching. Thank you, Pop will eat itself. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Thank you, guys.